Hello to the Chicos and the Chicas. Last video, the Chicos were left out because OBS did not want to record the first couple of seconds. So I am making sure now that the Chicos are getting the proper greeting as well. Guess what we haven't done for a long, long time. That is exactly right. It is No Die Classics. And uh, I do know that this is a series that um, is one of the less popular ones I do on my channel. But I also know that the real hardcore chess coach Andras fans love this to bits. And so here I come at you with yet another marvelous game that was not played by white against black. But it was much rather played by the world champion Boris Spassky against world champion candidate Lajos Portis from Hungary. To be fair though, um, at the time of the game, Spassky was not the reigning world champion. The game was played in 1977 and it was actually the um, match uh, in the candidates. Um, just for the record, just so that you guys understand the gravity and the magnitude of this game, um, we are talking here about the world number four against the world number five or six. That's about where you are. So if you would like to translate that to today's terms, uh, you get two fairly hefty players with uh, 2,800 rating uh, on each. So yeah, these were the times, ladies and gentlemen. And the opening two is actually an absolute delight for the true classicists because it was a Rui Lopez and in the Rui Lopez, Portis being uh, very proud of his Hungarian roots, plays De Brea, uh, which was named after uh, Jula or Julius, depending on whether you want to go with uh, the Hungarian or the more Latin and uh, perhaps Czech version of uh, the pronunciation and the origin of the name. So the Breyer system, um, which is this funky knight b8 knight d7 move, which was an absolute shock at the time when Breyer came up with it, but up to date, it actually withstood the test of time and is one of the best setups against the Rui Lopez. Um, you look at me now and going like, so why is everyone playing the Berlin then? Uh, the reason is quite simple, because this setup keeps a lot of play in the position for both colors. And as such, considering the trends of today's chess, it is too risky. Really, it, it is what it is. It's just too risky. And also most positions in the Brea, just a touch, just a touch passive um, with black. And I think that uh, the Berlin variations eliminate the passivity and the risk factor at the same time. And that is too much gains, um, once again, for the elite players of our chess in 2020. Um, two, three, four, five. And so hence the relatively... Um, dropped popularity of the Brea. So the starting position of the Brea, the Tabia, is somewhere around here, I would say. So we have already played, uh, what is it, um, 16 moves. And imagine what an absolutely sensational world it was to live in when you had no engines whatsoever and so none of the moves that led up to here could even be taken for granted let alone what is coming afterwards now a couple of words about what went down here just in terms of strategy and who is doing what and why so 9g3 is obviously a move that um covers the e4 pawn first and foremost note that after bishop f8 black is threatening to take d4 and then the e4 pawn is under attack by uh, a few too many. And so white had to guard it. Secondarily, uh, it has a chance. Secondly, it has a chance to jump into f5 every now and then. Which is why black tends to play g6. But it is also a move that black tends to play in order to play bishop g7. Now the reason why the Rui Lopez is a marvelous opening for everyone to study. Um, who would like to understand the chess strategy at its finest is because in most Rui Lopez main lines, the pawn structure is either, either flexible or somewhat flexible, which means that there is no almost never a very, very clear direction of play. You need to be sort of ready to play center, king side, queen side, and uh, once some level of clarity has been established on one wing or the other, that's when the game begins. 
um, for the respective sides. So here there is still a bit of to and froing. For example, a4 is a very common move in the Brea with the idea of playing bishop d3 and soften up the b5 pawn. And likewise, c5 is also a very common move in the Rui Lopez with black. If you think about the Chigorin variation that is fundamentally based on the knight a5 and then c5 move, targeting the center and allowing black to shut down this annoying attack on these pawns by pushing through to c4. Now white decided to close the center with d5, which is a very logical decision because usually what tends to happen if we don't do that, or a possible scenario is masses of trades, uh, after which, funnily enough, the e4 pawn is actually far more targetable. It's far weaker than its isolated body on d6. And with the two black bishops slicing and dicing along the long diagonals, it is definitely a super handy position to play with black. And so white closes the center and now threatens to pile up on the pawn by playing b3 first and then bishop d3 queen e2, which then would force black to take, thus splitting the pawns. So black immediately plays c4, a very annoying move from white's perspective, because now we can no longer play b3 or b4 without allowing the capture, which means that there is a knight coming to c5, and we have got fairly limited means to play on the queen side. The flip side of the equation is, is that once a knight pops up on c5, Black has got at least two minor pieces that are completely shoved away on the queen side. And if uh, game then switches and play switches rather to the king side, black is going to find it difficult to have enough pieces in the defense. Um, Bishop g5, we are still following theory. I would like to stress this. Um, a6, excuse me, Bishop back. It has been a very, very big theoretical debate whether it's worth provoking h6 or play immediately bishop e3. I think current theory sits on, yes, let's provoke h6, and then, yes, let's get a big fat tempo, uh, tempo on h6. And um, all the way up to here, it has all been played. As a matter of fact, and this is a fascinating story about this particular game and match between the two titans, is, is that the game that we are looking at right now was played about the eighth game of the match. And the third, I think, or second or third game had this exact position where Spassky played Rook A3. That is correct. And Portish actually went on to win in that game, if I recall rightly. And so Portish was more than happy to repeat the same opening, although he definitely anticipated some kind of a, an improvement from Spassky. Now, um, in this game, Spassky did indeed improve with Knight H2 which is a really, really cool idea, opening up the way of the pawn to f4. When I first started studying the Rui Lopez more in depth with my coach, um, international master Laszlo Hazai, he told me uh, that in many variations in the Rui Lopez, the, the core concept of the Rui Lopez is to play an improved version of the King's Gambit. And I actually just laughed it off like, yeah, man, whatever, like nothing in common. And then he went like, okay, check this out, buddy. Here we go, f4 is going to come, that's the eventual idea. It will take a fair few moves, so I'm not going to spoil the moves in between. But the idea is to play f4, it's not even going to be a pawn sack, and the idea is identical to the, well, at least similar to the King's Gambit, in that we want to use the f5 for an attack. Now let's take it one step of a time though. So, King h7, Knight h2. This is certainly a move that prepares the f4 break. Bishop g7, rook f1. Obviously now white is preparing and putting every single piece there is on ultimate best squares um, for the f4 break, h5. Now this move is particularly annoying for two reasons. One, it denies all kinds of knight g4 maneuvers, but two, it actually is threatening to play h4, kicking the knight and then just picking off the e4 pawn. So white needs to be cautious and measured and play first f3 and now h4 is no longer a concern and now the very annoying factor in the position that black can't deal with and in fact i think the engines already claimed this position to be vastly superior for white is the incoming bishop g5 pin 
there is just not an adequate response available for black whatsoever to meet this. Portish tried a very cunning idea that I think is a testament to his positional genius. And in some ways, it's a bit of a tragedy that it doesn't work. He plays queen e7 with the sensationally smart idea of playing queen f8 and bishop h6 to trade the dark squared bishops. And if he were to, uh, successful to trade those things, they trade those bishops off, black's position would be absolutely golden because this bishop is a piece of garbage and in the absence of the bishops the f4 break is going to be really really shaky for white the problem is is that black doesn't get to play the queen f8 bishop h6 without getting bruised in the process bishop g5 queen f8 and now comes the problem which is is that bishop h6 is not yet uh, threatening or it's not on the cards actually it is threatening because bishop f6 hangs the queen but uh, now is f4 just perfectly on time and portish is too late to the party with uh, the bishop h6 straight now in this moment i also need to make another detour or rather just uh, discuss f4 this is a break that a lot of club level players play all the time when it's actually wrong and from a pure positional perspective it looks wrong here too because f4 allows black two things one uh the opening of the diagonal of the g7 bishop which was a very very bad piece before f4 and two much more importantly it surrenders the e5 square for the black knight and so optically it looks very very dodgy and bad however there is one thing in chess, one, only one thing that beats such positional considerations as a beautiful knight on an outpost, amazing bishop, backward pawn, yada, yada, yada. Tactics, friend. Tactics. But what makes this position so utterly beautiful in my book is, is that in order to uncork the tactics here with white, we needed to have also... The positional understanding that after rook f1, knight e5, it doesn't matter anymore how beautiful these two pieces are because the play is now taking place on the king side and white has an extreme majority superiority in terms of number of pieces present in the area. So black is defending with three. Queen, bishop, knight. The rook is hardly a defender. And I'm attacking with two rooks, queen, bishop, knight, knight. Okay, you can disclude the h2 knight, but you will see why I'm including even that. So apart from the bishop on c2, which is very clearly a bystander for the time being, wink, wink, um, all white pieces are slicing and dicing on the king side. And so back in the day, if they had had the engines, they would have immediately dismissed this as completely unplayable, but... Without the engines, if you didn't exactly analyze this, which I think, by the way, Spassky and his team might have, this would be a hell of a position to get into. And the punishment? Knight h5. Ripping into the king side, opening up the king. And after pawn takes queen e2, um, the infiltration of the white heavy pieces will be decisive. But it's not quite the end yet. There was just one more nuance that Spassky had to see, because here Portish came up with this really clever queen h8, rook h4, and king g6 idea. Now, it looks as bad as a thing can look in chess, but unless we can prove it by sheer calculation that this is no bueno, um, it's definitely worth a go. Now, unfortunately, the engine here already claims that white has got myriads of ways to victory, but the most notable one is certainly the one that was played by Spassky, which was the cunning Bishop D1. And that is just a really, really cool move. Highlighting the Achilles heel of the position, the H5 pawn. Now, what's really beautiful about this position that, uh, is the fact that Bishop D1 casually hangs yet another piece, the G5 Bishop, and also the fact that it doesn't introduce an immediate threat. And so moves like these are really, really difficult to find. 
And again, my engine spits at you a plus five, but you don't know that when you are playing the game. And so, um, kudos to Spassky for finding this incredible idea of the piece sack followed by the pile up on the edge file, followed by bishop d1. To be clear, by the way, roughly the main threat for white here would be to play queen f2 next, introducing queen f5 mate, as well as bishop takes h5 check. And this essentially is unstoppable. Additionally to that, if bishop c8 is played, which is perhaps the best idea to at least cover the f5 square, I can just slide the bishop back, and now rook h5 is going to uh, ensure that the black king can't go back to safety anymore. And uh, yeah, black is just beaten. Takes, takes, queen g7, and um, I guess rook g5 would be a beautiful finish. Look at that bishop being the hero of the day. Wow! Wowza! That is remarkable. That is absolutely remarkable. So, um, in this position after bishop d1, I think Portish was contemplating resigning. By the way, another beautiful variation here for you after king takes g5. Again, I could win a queen by rook h5. It's not even top three moves of the engine. Just a cool... And measured queen f5 once again introducing various dirty mate ideas. And now the engine claims that there is actually no way of uh, escaping the Matutski. So after bishop e6 comes the surprising angle of the attack queen g3 this time round. Note that king h6 rook h5 is mate. And so I need to drop something in between. But uh, yeah, this is not going to cut it. In fact, queen f4 was probably already a forced mate here. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, actually, this is beautiful. Here, here, here. And now G3 mate is unstoppable. Oops. And again, it feels like the bishop on G4 is actually the hero of the day. So, yeah, this is just fantastic stuff. Uh, Portish played uh, F5, trying to, you know, create a flight square and the potential escape route. But, of course, rook takes F5 very crudely shuts that down. Now, the other purpose of F5 was to lure the rook to F5 so that at least it's not the queen sitting on that square. The problem now, however, is, is that now the bishop is guarded. And so after rook F8, I can now go in for the queen trade because even with the absence of the queens, the black king is in mortal danger. King H7, bishop F7 is almost mate. He had to give up a piece. And then another, and uh, that was the time to call it a day here with knight g4. The rook is safely guarded, the knight is hanging, bishop e5 check is pending, and white is exactly 47 pawns to the good. So, that was the very, very famous and spectacular uh, Spassky Portish. Remember, folks, this marvelous sacrifice, knight h5. And then all the white pieces flooding in on the king side. It is a sensational attack and a marvelous demonstration of what it means when coaches tell you that a successful attack requires peace majority in the attacked area. And his Pasky just demonstrated that. Yep, hold my B, buddy. I do think that uh, I have got a, a fair number of attackers around the king side, so I reckon I will be A-OK, -okay. and I do think that he was A-OK. -okay. Um, for the aficionados of opening theory, I would like to add that I did a bit of a research, and I found that Portish actually engaged with this variation once more in the exact same year against uh, another titan uh, of the 70s and 80s, Jan Timman. And um, that game went exactly like this. And in this position, instead of the bishop g7 move, it might have been this position actually, he took on a4 with the knight. And ended up in actually an absolutely horrific position. Later on, uh, Timman still played f4 and uh, the king side opened up in a similar fashion and Portish was under a tremendous pressure. But uh, miraculously, he actually survived the attack and even... Uh, went on to win, but if I recall rightly, I think that was his last goal with this particular variation um, So yeah, 
Ladies and gents, that was No Die Classics, the legendary Spassky Portage game for you. I hope you guys enjoyed it. Please don't forget to sub to like the super thank if you can. And I'm going to see you. See you. That's the word. See you in the next video. Thanks for watching.